Stay hungry, stay foolish. Inside each of us is a vision of how things could be, yet most remain frustrated by a lack of impact, unable to connect and inspire the people they care about most. Why? There's a language we understand but rarely use, a language that's sincere, powerful, compelling, a language of words and actions that can't be denied. Leadership language will help you peel back the ineffective business speak so you can change the conversation and change your results. Imagine what could happen when you replace frustration with an irresistible vision for yourself, for your team, for your organization. We welcome author of Leadership Language Using Authentic Communication to Drive Results, Chris Westfall. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Chris, I thought we would set the scene for today's show with the tragic story of the forest fire in Montana. And while it's a tragic tale, it highlights the importance of leadership language. The story you're referencing is one of the ones in the book that looks at uh, an incident that actually happened. It's a historical incident that happened in an area of the world called Man Gulch. And it is, as you mentioned, it's a tragic story of uh, 14 firefighters who were called in to put out a fire that they thought was no big deal in a remote area of the Helena National Forest, which is located in, in Montana here in the United States, a remote part of the world. And they went in with a set of preconceptions, a set of prejudgments of what the situation was going to involve. And as you might expect, the wind shifted, the circumstances changed, and their leader in the midst of pandemonium and confusion that was caused by, by flames that were much larger than expected and that had surrounded the men on three sides as they were standing on a hillside, the leader had a decision to make, a choice, a choice to help his men. And of course, that was the choice that he made. But in spite of his best efforts, he was unable to save the lives of any of the men who remained on that ridge, save for his own. And when leadership results in the leader saving himself alone, it's not effective. And the Man Gulch Fire is a cautionary tale for all of us of a failure in communication, a failure in preconceptions. And the story really points towards the importance of effective leadership communication because on a remote ridge in Montana or in your business, the wind can shift. Things can change unexpectedly. And we have to be prepared to deliver the message that's going to help the entire team, not just save the leader. I love what you say in the introduction, Chris, regarding this reaction and how to be proactive with your leadership language. You say that leadership's not a recipe, it's a verb. It's true. And if you want to know if you're an effective leader, I mean, you you don't look at the title on your business card or the bars on your collar. It's demonstrated in action. And if you want to know if someone is an effective leader, don't look at what they're doing. Look at what the team is doing. And that's how the, the leader is measured. Leadership is about service. That's no secret. But that selfless approach, the approach of true empowerment for a team is the key to success. That's true. That's true in any sport you want to choose, but it's true in business. And it's true if you want to make your relationships really matter. Make the people around you the hero of your story and you'll see leadership in action. I enjoy how you make this reference throughout the book that any stakeholder in your world should be reframed as your client. And this echoes the sentiments of last week's episode we did with Heather MacArthur as well, that when you treat those people like clients, then you might treat them a little bit better and you might make them feel a little bit better. Yeah, that's so true. The way I define it is a client is anyone upon whom your success depends. So a client is a tradition, you know, it's a traditional client or a customer, someone who buys your products and services, of course, but it's also the the people on your team. It's your boss. It's your stakeholders, shareholders, board of directors. I had, I had one guy say to me when I was explaining the idea of how everyone around you is, is your client, the people upon whom your success depends. And he said, so does that mean that my wife is my client? And I said, I sure hope so. (laughs) (laughs) So, so yeah, looking at people as, as your clients 
puts us in the in the mindset and the frame of reference that's really appropriate for leadership and for impact if you care about the people who are around you. Yeah, I, I certainly know. I'm. I, I see myself more as my wife's. Uh, I don't know what I call myself <laughs> regards my wife. I certainly <laughs> maybe Sherpa. Sherpa. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what am I? Okay, I, I better. If I better. Listening, honey, I apologize. <laughs> so we talked about the tragic story of of Man Gulch, but you equally talk about the importance of storytelling and communication, and you bring this to life in a positive story. And I love this one. This is the story of the goat girl. Macaulay McCunningham. Yes, Macaulay, who at at the time when I met her, Macaulay was just a freshman in college and not just at any college, but at the fifth largest university here in the United States. And she came to me and she wanted to win. And what she wanted to win was a, a pitch competition, a competition where she would be going up against other student entrepreneurs, including MBAs, PhD students, engineers, some very sophisticated entrepreneurs. And she wanted to be to pitch her business idea, which was an innovative solution for uh, preserving uh, foods, uh, fruits and vegetables. And McCallie on, on paper didn't seem to have a background that was particularly outstanding, although she is an outstanding person. She came from a very small town and she she brought to the conversation uh, a desire to see things in a new way, a desire to discover a new kind of conversation. And when she did, when she looked in that direction and made a discovery, a discovery of, of what I'm pointing to in the book, which is what I call leadership language, when she discovered her own leadership language, she skyrocketed past the other individuals in the competition. And one of the greatest thrills in my career was being able to announce the winner because not only had I coached all the participants, but I also was the MC for the event. So in front of a live audience, I, I got to announce that McCallie was the one who walked away with first prize. And it was at that point that I told the audience because they didn't know that she was just a college freshman. And to see her harness the power of leadership communication, it really reinforced to me how important it is that if you want to win in, in anything, in business, in life, in your relationships, if you want to create victory, whatever those, that word might mean to you, you have to focus on your story and the way that you connect with, with your audience. And, and not just focus on your story like rehearse a good fiction and see if you can get people to believe it, but Thinking about your story in the way that life works, which is as a dialogue, a conversation, a conversation that is not purely scripted. It is not rehearsed. You have to be in a place where you can, you can respond to the unexpected challenges and the questions and the, and the things that come up. And that was what McCallie found. And she continued to find over the course of uh, her time uh, in, in college and her, her skills in pitching her business idea led her all over the United States. She traveled all over the country because of the things that she learned and the things that we discovered together. So leadership language is about that discovery. If you're interested in making it, if you're interested in making a discovery that can lead you to stronger relationships, greater connection, greater engagement, and the ability to deal with the slings and arrows that life throws at you, the unexpected challenges that require you to go off script, that require you to improvise because life is a bit of uh, an improvisation. You talk about this element of credibility later on in the book, but I'm going to bring it forward to this part of the book because mm. you talk later about the great example of the babysitter next door. I thought this was a great way for us to understand how credibility backed by the letters at the end of somebody's name versus the actual authenticity is a very big difference between those two things. Well, there's two questions that show up when it comes to credibility because when we think about our own credibility, right? It means, are we believable? Are we trustworthy? And the first thing that shows up is, well, if I'm going to prove my credibility, I have to talk about my experience. I have to talk about what I've done in the past and what I've accomplished. But there's a, a stronger question, a second question that's more powerful than what is your experience? And that question is, can you help us? And if you can prove and create trust and belief in the experience that you can create for your clients. Your past experience is important, but it's not the deciding factor. 
And the story that I tell in the book is about a young couple that wants to go out on a date and they've got a three-year-old baby at home and they need to find a babysitter. And in the house next door, a woman has just moved in from another town and she has a 20-year history of running a daycare. She's got advanced degrees in childhood education. She's got this pristine resume of being an excellent caregiver for children and she's available to watch their 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 toddler on this evening. And then across the street is a young girl. She's just 17 years old and the couple has known her for most of her life and she's babysat for the couple before and she's also available to watch the, their child. So the question is who do they choose? And the answer is obvious. They choose the young girl who lives across the street. And the answer to why would they choose her isn't because of her experience. It's because of trust. It's because of trust and the fact that they know her. And that trust is the real source of credibility. In other words, what this story points to is connection and relationship matters. Sure, it's important what you have on your resume, your CV, what you've done in the past is valuable. And I don't, I don't mean to diminish it, but relationships and connection are the keys to credibility. And the experience that you can create for your clients is the one that will get you paid and get you chosen for the job above others, even others who may be on paper more qualified for the role. You build on the thoughts of Peter Drucker here, and you say that. Leadership is about doing things right for the clients we serve. To extend that quote, you know, leadership is about doing the right things. Management is about doing things right. And doing the right things for the people that we serve means looking in the direction of what's going to create the greatest impact for the people that you care about. That's the direction of leadership language. Chris, you talk in the book, you devote a lot of time to reframing failure and we had a little chat about this off air before the show is and mm -hmm. you talk about your own course correction because i love this term course correction because it means that you're headed in a general direction a vision that you may have but the road is never as you plan it and you had this experience yourself where you live now came out of one of these course corrections in your life it's true. I live in a place because of one of the greatest mistakes i made in my career and and Aiden, i mean i i thought I thought my wife was going to divorce me because of what I went through. I, it, it, it's a tough story to talk about because it really, on the surface, looked like this gigantic mistake that was not only going to create a rupture in my career, but also in my marriage. I was working as a consultant for a company in Houston, Texas. And the CEO of the company, as part of our work, he sat me down and he said, Chris, I think I'd like to hire you for a full-time position in the company. And I said, that's, that's a mistake. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I, I have a job. I'm speaking, writing, and consulting, and I love what I'm doing. And I work with companies like yours, and it's a, it's a perfect arrangement. I'm not interested in a full-time job. Also, I don't have a background in your industry. You're hiring me from my outside perspective. If I were an employee, it would lose its value. That's a mistake. And he said to me, well, how much would it take? And I thought for a second, and I, I pulled out a napkin and I wrote down a number and I said, well, how about this? And he said, done. When can you start? And everything changed. And all of a sudden I found myself working remotely, traveling uh, during the week and working in Houston, Texas, a, a strange city to me, one that I had visited before, but certainly not uh, my home. And it wasn't, but about 94 days later, after I had started working for the company that the CEO called me into his office and he said, Chris, I've got some bad news. I'm afraid it's just not working out and uh, I'm going to have to let you go. And I thought, well, I understand. I mean, business deals, you know, sometimes we go into a relationship and uh, it just doesn't work out. And that's happened to me before. And I've also had people who, quite frankly, don't listen to their consultants. I told him it was a bad idea. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when he told me this information, it wasn't just about a business decision that impacted me because I had moved my family six weeks before to Houston, Texas. 
And now I had a responsibility to let my wife know that our recent move was a mistake. And my wife, who is a wonderful woman, but very reluctant about moving, and it was incredibly difficult to get her to, to make the move, as you can imagine, I thought she was going to kill me. And so I drove around for two hours after I, after I got the news. I, I drove around for two hours, which in Houston traffic means that I went about four miles. But, uh, <laughs> that's another, uh, sorry, that's a little aside there. For those of you that are listening in Houston, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, I, I drove around for two hours just trying to get up the courage to come home and share with my wife what had happened. And I had to tell her that... Um, you know, the reason we had moved here didn't exist anymore. So I walked in, I gathered my courage and my wife said, hi, what are you doing home in the middle of the day? And I said, sit down, we need to talk. And I explained the situation as best I could, waiting and bracing for impact. And she looked at me and the first words out of her mouth were, well, just don't ask me to move again. Right. And I thought, I, I know. I, I thought, what? That's it? Where's, where's, the, where's the yelling? Where's the screaming? Where's everything that I imagined out on the freeway? And, and it, was, it was nowhere to be found. And, and I realized something as I quickly picked back up with my consulting, speaking, writing business and picked up right where I left off without missing a beat. I realized that what looked like a gigantic mistake, uh, 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 an error in, in judgment, an error in career trajectory – was actually one of the one of the greatest decisions that I could have made. And I today live in Houston, Texas, and I'm proud to say that I do because this city has given a lot to my wife, to my daughter, who's enrolled in a, a very uh, prestigious school. She goes to the high school for performing arts here in Houston, which uh, is a school that boasts alumni like Beyonce Knowles. And it is a fantastic opportunity in a fantastic city for us. So from this situation that on the surface looked and felt like a horrible mistake, a mistake that was going to jeopardize my career as well as my marriage, none of that proved to be true. And I, if there's a moral to this story, Aiden, it's, it's that the, the way that we imagine things and label things and characterize things in our minds are often so much worse than how they really are. And when we find the courage to have the conversation that we need to have, uh, the answers might be very, very surprising indeed. It also highlights, and you talk about this in the book, the labels we give to events in our lives and the way we frame them or the imagined limitations that we have in life are so important. We need to be ultra vigilant of how we do that and what we say to ourselves and our self-talk and all these things. Absolutely true. You know, and I've been doing a bunch of work with entrepreneurs. It just, just so happens that that's, that's where I'm at this week. And so many entrepreneurs, when it comes time to ask for money for their business idea, because I provide a lot of coaching on, on how to pitch your ideas and how to, how to attract investors and, and gain funding for your innovation. And for these entrepreneurs, and it, and it's not just it's not just true for these entrepreneurs it's it's true for this entrepreneur it's true for me as well when it comes to asking for money we attach so many labels to to whatever that figure might be whether it's expressed in dollars euros or pounds when we think of a large number i mean it it's easy to fill in the blank with what a large number is but you know is is $50,000 a large number or what about 500,000 pounds? Is that a large number? Or how about 5 million pounds? The, the answer is none of those are large. They're just numbers. They're neither large nor small. I mean, if, if it's $50,000 for a pen, it's very expensive. But if you're buying a Mercedes, that's kind of a good starting place. So a number is neither big nor small except for the way that we characterize it. And sometimes when we approach particularly numbers, but other information with a detached perspective, a perspective that says this, this may or may not be large, this may or may not be a mistake. And we give people the opportunity to evaluate things without putting that, that color commentary that, that comes along so many times, that, that filter that we use that constantly labels the, the events and circumstances and people around us. But my question is, do those labels really serve you? And is the number something that's large or small or something that's attractive or something to reject? 
or is it just a number? Is it just a number? And sometimes letting the thing be what it is, is the first step to finding new results. This self-talk thing is is so true as for life. Like people walking around with limiting language in their heads of, you know, how they look, how they may be overweight. And when they go to the gym, they're not getting mm. the results because they're still seeing themselves as the way they don't want to be. It's one of these things I really like to shine a light on with this show. Well, it's so important because we all have exactly what you're talking about. We all have a lot of thinking going on about our circumstances, about body images, about how often we work out, what we should or shouldn't be eating. I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. But the thing that shows up for me is, is this question. How big is a problem when you're not thinking about it? We realize that when you're not thinking about a problem, it's not really a problem. And that's, that's not that I'm advocating being a place of ignorance because it's bliss. That's not what I'm saying. But when we are thinking about problems, they are problems. Could it be that it is our thinking that creates the problem? And, and from my perspective, I think the answer is yes. That, you know, as the quote says, there, there is nothing neither good nor bad in this world, but our thinking makes it so. And so many times people look in that direction and they think, oh man, you know what that means? I need to change my thinking. I need to change my mindset. I need to adapt a new set of thoughts and try to, you know, which, which points in the direction of trying to tell yourself the best lie you can think of and then believe in it so that you can change your state. But here's the thing that shows up for me. What if the state that we are all in and we will always be in is a state where we are living in our thinking? And when thinking shows up and labels show up that, that, you know, where we try to define ourselves based on a misunderstanding. What shows up for me is an opportunity for, for me just to realize that it's just a thought, just thinking. I mean, if a train of thought shows up, that doesn't mean I have to ride that train. That doesn't mean that that train is really there for me. And so many times the misinformation and the misunderstandings that are running through our heads are, are leading us away from the action that, that really points in the direction of leadership, that really points in the direction of results. And if we're lost in thought, one thing that can be very helpful is to understand that it's just a thought and there's another one on the way. And, you know, I've experienced this myself. There have been times where I've been in the midst of, of circumstances. I got a lot going on and there's so many things that I've, I'm so busy and everything like that. And I feel a lot of stress. And then there are other times when I have a lot going on, I'm so busy and everything like that, and I don't feel a lot of stress. The circumstances are very, very similar, but the, the feeling is quite different. And what is it that, that's changed? Well, it's, it's my thinking. Or a better way to say it is how much attention I pay to my thinking. You talk here about looking to the past to imagine the future, which a lot of us look at our past and see it as a record of who we are instead of actually looking at the future as a map for where we can be. Mm, true. And the world is filled with millions of stories of people who are who they are, either because of their past or in spite of it. And people overcome their past circumstances every day. It's, <laughs> again, if, if you want to know where your past influences your future, the answer is in your thinking. The only way we can access the past is when we think of it, when we call up the memories and we choose to characterize and label those historical events that are part of our memory, and we choose to label them a certain way. And that label creates our thinking, which leads to the way that we act. And my question is, just because you have thinking about your past, why does it have to determine your future? What happens if you get right here, right now? What, ha what happens if you look out of the windshield instead of looking in the rearview mirror? You know, as the quote says, never look behind you unless you're planning on going that way. That's the row, <laughs> and that's what he said. That's, and it's, it's wise advice. It's wise yeah. advice because I'll tell you what, what I got for Christmas when I was nine years old, the only way that can have a bearing on this conversation is if I allow it to. It's here you talk about conquering change and that we enjoy as humans, we enjoy a mix of the familiar and the novelty. And this is really important when it comes to leadership language and leadership storytelling. Absolutely. We'll take, here's a quick question for the, for the listeners. You can, kind of, you can kind of prove this theory that I put forward in the book. Ask yourself this question in general terms, which do you prefer in general terms? Do you prefer something that is new 
or do you prefer something that is familiar? This is true when it comes to any aspect of our lives. There is a combination of factors between what is known and what is new that leads us to any decision. And one of the quotes that I reference is from Carmen Simon. She wrote a book called Impossible to Ignore. And one of the theories that she puts forward that is so true is that the past is only useful in that it helps us to predict the future. Our decisions about the future are going to be made based on our thinking in the moment. And our thinking in the moment, as I've said before, can be reflections on the past and our past circumstances. I mean, that's why we don't put our hand on a hot stove because we know that it burns us. Either we remember it because we've been told or because we've actually put our hand on a hot stove. So when it comes to making decisions and helping others to, to make decisions and take action in the, in the face of circumstances, using what's known to get to what's new is the path to leadership, starting not, not with what you know, but what your audience, your client knows to be true. That is the frame of reference, that, that context that can help people to go to a place that they, they have not discovered or they have not visited before by using what's known to get to what's new. Yeah, this really resonated with me. I don't know if you've heard this one, but you know the Disney movie, The Lion King? Mm, yeah. So that story, they could not sell it to Disney. They weren't buying that story at all until the leadership team who, were, who created the concept explained it as Hamlet. And they went, it's actually the story of Hamlet told with this lions and this lion kingdom. And when then they understood it, they understood the context of it and they went, ah, now we get it. And it really resonated with me because you say in the book, it's a fantastic communication skill when we can create familiarity where none supposedly exists. Absolutely. And the way to do that, and I outline it in the book, is by looking in the direction of something that I call a high concept. And a high concept is an overall, it's a theme or idea that anyone anywhere can say yes to. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Dublin or Detroit or Dallas, it's something that everyone sees as being a, a truth. And, and looking in the direction of the high concept points towards connection, connection, the, the, the humanity that connects us all. And let, let me just give a quick example for the listeners of what, a, what is a high concept. Um, and usually a high concept fits in, in this framework. Doesn't it seem like blank? So here's one. Doesn't it seem like we all want a sense of family and belonging? I, I mean, I would say that's true. That's true no matter where you are, no matter what your family circumstances are. We all want a sense of family and belonging. Uh, another one. Doesn't it seem like we all want a sense of safety in the workplace? And, and that's true no matter where you work, especially if you work in a dangerous environment. Safety is especially important. So these high concepts point towards um, the first yes in a leadership conversation. It can be a view from 50,000 feet of the initiatives at hand, the services that your organization provides, or the new ideas that you'd like to share with your team. What is the view from 50,000 feet of something that all God's children can relate to, regardless of which God you worship, you can connect with a high concept. And it's the first yes in, in the conversation. Now, I, I shared this idea with a guy one time and I, I said, look, do you understand this idea of the high concept? It's the first yes. He says, I absolutely do. I want to share my high concept with you. I said, stand up, give me your high concept. What is it? He says, do you have kids? <laughs> I'm like, no. no, no, it is not if then. It is not jump over the stick and I'll keep talking to you. It's about a yes. Don't provide an opt out. Create a high concept. Create that first yes. I mean, if you wish to be persuasive in the leadership conversation, by the way, effective leadership conversations are persuasive. Look in the direction of the high concept and it will point you towards the impact and the bigger picture that you want your clients to see. Here you mentioned as well, uh, when you're talking about change, that instead of fighting for a past that no longer serves us, we must remember the words of the scientist Roger von Uck, and he says, always look for the second right answer. I love that concept. <laughs> me too, me too. I think that's so important, because if, if we think, oh, I got this, you know, and then the search stops, and we get, we get lost uh, in congratulating ourselves, or, you know, taking a victory lap, or, uh, you know, <laughs> once you've come up with uh, a good answer, my question is, is there a better one? And, and that's not just a question for you, but that's a question for your team. Is there a way to do it better? 
And, and that's what the quote really points to. Always look to the second right answer. Here you shift our, our focus in the book to the concept of the empty chair. Again, one I hadn't heard of that I absolutely loved in life, in every aspect. I started applying it myself when I read about it and started seeing that empty chair for people really important in my world. Well, the empty chair is a really powerful concept because it can give you the ability to read minds. And, and let me explain what, what I mean by that, and, I'll, and I'll, share, I'll, I'll share the story of the empty chair with the listeners so that they can use this as well, if, if they choose to, because it, this has been a, a story and an element that, that has created transformation in businesses and in people's lives. And, and the empty chair is simply a metaphorical seat at the table for somebody who's not in the room, but who will be directly and personally impacted by the change that you propose. Because... All persuasive conversations are about change in some form or fashion. The empty chair is a seat at the table for the third grade student who's going to read the history textbook next year. And she's, she's not in the room when the teachers and school administrators make a decision about that history textbook. And yet, she will be directly and personally impacted by the change that they propose because that history book is the way that she's going to come to understand the world. Uh, the, the empty chair, it's a seat at the table for the patient who's going to go through the MRI machine, the sophisticated medical device for uh, analysis of disease. The patient who's going to go through that machine, she's not in the room when the doctors and hospital administrators are making a seven-figure investment decision and yet personally, directly, and powerfully impacted by that decision. In, in every leadership decision, there is always an empty chair at the table. And the empty chair points to an important aspect of human nature. And, and see if you see this, because I'll explain it for myself and see if, if you can explain it for yourself as well. I right now, as, as we are doing this interview, I have people who are, who are here with me, but I mean, they're not, they're not literally, literally here with me. I mean, they're, they're here with me in my mind. I'm talking about my family, my loved ones, uh, the vendors that support me, the clients that I support. I mean, these, these are the people who sit in my empty chair. And while I know that I am wired to focus on my own self-interest, that's part of the survival instinct and part of our, our lizard brain. It's a part of the way human beings are wired. I also am focused on the people that I care about. And those people sit in my empty chair. Now, as you're listening to the story of the empty chair, I, I wonder who sits in your empty chair. Because if you have people who sit in your empty chair, and I have people who sit in my empty chair, that means that everyone around you has someone who sits in the empty chair. And when you look in the direction of the empty chair, you look beyond just the people who are right in front of you. You look at the impact. You look and see the people that they care about, the people who sit in their empty chair. And this concept can help you to Read minds and, and not by hypnosis or mumbo jumbo or anything like that. I'm, I'm just talking about a principle of the way human beings are wired. When you look in the direction of the empty chair, you go beyond acknowledgement and recognition. You say, not only do I see you, but I see the people that you really care about. And from this place, you can create a different kind of conversation when you really sincerely look in the direction of the empty chair. It's so important for vision as well. Like if you have a vision, bring it back to even a goal like I want to get healthier and you see the person or the reason you're doing it and the people that will be impacted, it's so much more powerful than the vision alone. I, I love that concept and I hope our listeners do as well. But you shift then your attention towards uh, anticipation. And I loved this one again, a brilliant analogy of baseball. Well, baseball is a game that is based on anticipation. And that's true for football as well. That's true in rugby. That's true in any sporting event that you choose. Anticipation is a superpower that we all possess. And for the leader, being able to look in the direction of where others are going and look at the direction of the actions around you, that's really the, the key to the leader's vision. In the book, I share a story about how Hitting a major league fastball in baseball is scientifically impossible. Physicists at Yale University proved that there is simply not enough time for you to hit a major league fastball because of the speed and the distance involved and the milliseconds in which to make a decision. The math doesn't work out. You can find that out in the book. It's a fascinating story. And yet there are athletes who 
hit the major league fastball every day. And for the athletes that you admire, as well as for yourself, your ability to anticipate is key to your ability to create impact and to see new results for yourself and for your teams. The book tells more about that story. And there's, there's also a story about a gentleman who went to uh, what's called a batting cage. A batting cage is where they have a machine that actually fires fastballs at you and you can, you can hit, you know, the machine just throws one ball after another. And that's how you can practice to practice your swing and practice hitting. Well, this gent decided to step out of the batting cage and walk closer and closer to the machine because he wanted to have the challenge of hitting a fastball that was coming at him at the velocity of over 260 miles an hour. And he wanted to see if he could hit it. And he developed the skills to be able to do so. And by the way, he's not a major league baseball player. He's a 54-year-old security guard from Detroit, Michigan. It's a fascinating story. And I think I have a link in there to the YouTube video where you can watch, uh, you can watch him go out, step closer to the batting machine and, and hit these balls. And it is, it is an amazing story. But we all have the ability to anticipate. And even if you're not going to risk your life in front of a batting machine, you can anticipate the needs of others and looking in that direction. It's very, very important for those who wish to harness leadership language. When you talked about the winds of change shifting like it did in the unfortunate case of the forest fire here, it's a case of anticipating the curveball because we always get them in life. Moving on, you talk about this great concept, leaders need to be time travelers. And I love this idea because a very visual mind of me going into the future and seeing a desired future for the team or the business or my life and then passing back into the present and presenting what I saw to my people to inspire them. What a great visioning exercise. I mean, asking people to take themselves into the future is really what the traveler's story is all about. And it's inspired actually by a a Netflix series called Travelers. And it's a story about folks who come back traveling through time to try to fix the future by working on the present. And it's a wildly inventive series. But the point of the traveler's story is to ask people, and maybe your listeners want to do this. Of course, if you're driving right now, please don't stop. Don't do it unless you stop and pull over to the side of the road. But it's compose an email to yourself. Well, if they're in Houston traffic, if they're in Houston traffic, they're fine, man. (laughs) They might have time. That's exactly right. Just sit there, put put back the the top (laughs) on your convertible or whatever. So, uh, but yeah, if if you if you have time, it could be really, really a very interesting experience. Experience, and it's exactly what you said, Aiden. It's it's an experiment where you envision yourself twelve months from now, one year in the future, and you are writing an email to your current self. And you're explaining all of the wonderful things that have happened in the course of the last year, the things that you wish uh, would occur or the things that you, you see for yourself that you can see very clearly. And when you send this traveler email, it can be very, very valuable to take a look at the things that you'd like to accomplish for yourself. And I, I guess that's the way that you've used it as well, right? It's kind of a visioning exercise for yourself and your team. Absolutely. And you talk about yeah. here that um, you may go forward in the future and you see the vision, but then you you realize that I have a massive lack of knowledge here, but that's actually where the leadership journey begins. Sure. Because resourcefulness is one of the key components of leadership. And how can you find the resources that you need until you identify what it is that you don't have? So it's a very, very valuable exercise. And leaders have to be candid and frank and say, if there is something lacking, to to have the courage to look at your blind spots, and not get lost in a, an ego journey where you fall in love with the smell of your own aftershave. You have to look. <laughs> you, I mean, I'm just, I'm just calling balls and strikes here. But you, you have to be willing to look at what's missing, and then have the courage to find the resources that you need, either to get the training, to find the coaching, to hire the people, or to acquire the skills to get you where you need to go. And here you emphasize the need for another part of communication, which is not just the storytelling, but the listening, and that there's three ways that we can listen. Absolutely. And you see these every day. The first way to listen is to listen to affirm, which is very, very typical. We're listening, but we're, we're affirming what we already know. You know, what, what this guy is saying, he reminds me of something I read in a book by Stephen Covey, for example. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the kind of stuff that happen, happens all the time, right? And we confirm what we already know, which is a reinforcement of conversational bias, quite frankly. 
But it's very reassuring and it's nice. It's like, oh, I, I know what he's talking about. I'm very familiar with that. You know, and we validate ourselves and our experience when we listen to a firm. But unfortunately, there's there's something missing in our listening if we're just confirming our past experiences. So the, the second way to listen is to listen to defend. And this is the way that uh, attorneys and barristers and folks in the, the legal system listen. They are listening to take uh, an angle, a defensive posture, if you will, on an idea so that they can can defend their own ideology. And, and when you listen to defend, you close yourself off from new possibilities. You're really just waiting to talk and, quite frankly, waiting to attack as you listen to defend. So listening to defend happens because sometimes people say things that don't make sense and we need to defend ourselves. But when we do that, we close ourselves off from possibility. And for leaders who are interested in exploring those possibilities, there's a third way to listen, and that's to listen to discover. And listening to discover is hopefully the way that people come to, to this program, listening to discover new ideas. And in the workplace, so many times we get lost in this idea, oh, we've heard this all before. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It confirms what I already know. But what about listening to discover what it is that you don't? What about listening to discover by dropping your guard? And releasing yourself from the obligation to defend a particular point of view so that you can understand someone else's. That's the kind of discovery that's so important. And I'll, I'll just I'll just share this, this quick idea with you. And you tell me if, if you see this and, and if it's true, it's that no one, none of us is as smart as all of us. Love that. And even if you are, you, are you with me on that? Absolutely. Love that, man. Yeah. I mean, even if you are the smartest guy in the room, whatever that means, if you are lost in your own ego journey, you're not going to be able to see your blind spot. You're not going to be receptive to the information you need to know. You're not going to gain access to the resources that you need because you're lost in your own thought and thinking. So shifting gears to a place of discovery can help you to see things in a new way and quite frankly, to see new results. Yeah, and that concept ties together so many of the traits that are needed to be a leadership and a leadership communicator. And you say here that the vision must include at least one of four main components in order to be effective. The leadership vision has to be on some level innovative. It has to be counterintuitive. It has to be surprising or unexpected. And you may say, Chris, all of those things, counterintuitive, that, that, that sounds like something that's going to be hard to access. No, it's something that is disarming. It is something that is a pattern interrupt. It's something that says you have not heard everything there is to say on this subject. There is something counterintuitive that you did not expect. There's something surprising. And the leader points people in the direction of change. And I'll, I'll tell you why this is so important. Because as human beings, we are wired to crave consistency and recognize change. The stories that we love, the movies that we see, they're stories of a journey of change in some form or fashion. And that change is what we are drawn to. And it's true in the storytelling that takes place in the workplace as well. So when you look at what's unexpected or counterintuitive, it's a pattern interrupt if you do it correctly. And it's a place where you can help lead people to a new understanding about what change really means and helping them to, to know that change doesn't have to be something that, that is scary. In fact, as, as the saying goes, the only thing constant is change. Change is all around us. And changing to new results is never more than one thought away. This is why I love this new information because it's the new information that feeds the new output. It's fantastic. There's an equation you mm, mm. suggest in the book, and I love this one, and I'd love if you elaborated a little for our listenership, is vision plus acceptance equals direction. That equation, vision plus acceptance equals direction, is a key to creating new initiatives. And I'll tell you why, because it's not enough to just have a vision. You have to have acceptance. In fact, the, the leader's job is to gain that acceptance. So leaders look in the direction of receptivity. They use what's known to get to what's new. And when you have a vision, that's great. Congratulations. <laughs> but when other people share and accept your vision, that's when you create direction. That's when your ideas turn into action. And ideas without action, they're just dreams. 
They're just, they're just visions. They're just hallucinations. <laughs> but when you get other people enrolled, your ideas, your schemes can actually create the impossible. Yeah, and I'm going to bring this right back to what we talked about earlier about letting go of limiting mindsets and limiting thoughts. And you talk about the brilliant concept of unbranding ourselves and letting go of labels, past experiences, or mindsets that no longer serve us. Well, I learned about unbranding in a conversation with Murray Wilcox. And I talk about it in the book. And there's actually a link if you want to uh, watch the actual interview that I conducted with Murray Wilcox. But Murray Wilcox is a 23-year-old South African extreme surfer which means that he goes off the coast of Cape Town in search of waves that are over 15 feet high. And I know just from research that I did that even a 10-foot wave, if you get buried underneath it, a 10-foot wave can weigh as much as 400 tons and can crush a human being easily. So a 15-foot wave, a 20-foot wave, a 25-foot wave, that's what this guy is going out in search of. And I asked Murray Wilcox a really important question. I said, Murray, when you were at the top, of a 25 foot wave, what's going through your mind? I mean, what's, what's your mindset? What is your attack pattern? How, what exactly is it that you are thinking about? And he paused for a second when I asked him this question. And then he said, the answer is nothing. And I thought, what do you mean nothing? Surely you've got to be thinking, are you going to turn left? Are you going to turn right? I mean, how are you going to play this? He says, no, I, I don't have any of that on my mind because when it's the top of the wave, you have no choice but to be in the moment. You have no choice but to get out of your thinking and you can't be thinking about what others have told you or things that you've learned or your past experience or does my wetsuit look cool? You can't be thinking about any of those things because you have to be engaged in the moment. And, it, and it's that level of engagement that is really found in what I call the unbranding conversation, where we get out of this idea of being branded by our past experience, branded by the people around us who give us well-intentioned advice, which may or may not serve us, branded by the thinking that keeps us away from solving real problems. We, we get trapped in, in a planning exercise. We get trapped by these, these labels and these ideas. And again, the, the path away, the path away from the thinking that doesn't serve us isn't simply to focus on our mindset. It's to recognize we've got some thinking going on. How about that? Because <laughs> we all do. That's, that's how we're wired. You, you don't necessarily have to adopt a new mindset when you recognize the way things work. The way things work is we're going to have some thinking around our circumstances and the people around us and the challenges that we're facing. But when we let go of that thinking, now it's time to surf the wave. Now it's time to take action. Yeah, that's, that's the unbranding conversation. And, and the question for the listeners today is, are you going to be lost in thought? Or are you going to take action? And if you go, well, I can't, I, got, I just got so much thinking. Unless I can get out of my head, I can't take action. When do you ever get out of your head? I mean, we're always thinking is, is my point. And sometimes the thoughts serve us and sometimes they don't. But the point is the way that we see the world is not the way that the world necessarily is. It's the way that we process that world. Let me, let me give you an example. Like two, two people come up to a, a mountain, a mountain, okay? And the first person looks at that mountain and says, man, I would love to hike that. In fact, I'd love to get a guide and maybe climb to the top of that thing, give me a sense of accomplishment. And I would love to do that. The second person looks at that mountain and goes, man, the last thing I want to do is hike that mountain. I don't want to go up there. I would rather go sit on my couch and watch Netflix. So my question is, is the mountain a good thing or a bad thing? Is the mountain something to be hiked or is it something to be avoided? And the answer is, it depends on your perspective. It depends on your thinking. It is our thinking about a subject that makes it a certain way. And by the way, you can think, boy, I'd rather be on my couch and watch Netflix and still take the first step towards hiking that mountain. And I know this myself because there have been times when I have had to, to perform, whether it's a keynote, a coaching assignment, working with a client, uh, delivering on some materials, whatever the case may be. And my mindset, quite frankly, kind of lousy. And yet, in spite of the way I was feeling, in spite of the, what I was thinking, I was still able to perform. 
and professionals and leaders are able to perform in spite of their thinking because they realize that thinking is always going on. It's like that scene at the end of the Avengers. I don't know if you saw this movie. They've got a new Avengers movie that's coming out as we record this, but this was the, the original Avengers movie. And it was the part in the movie where the, the monsters have been just destroying New York. I mean, these are these huge flying 900 foot metal caterpillars that are coming out of the sky and, and they're just killing it with the, the Avengers and they're destroying the city. And uh, Captain America is like, we need the Hulk. Where's the Hulk? And Iron Man is like, yeah, we got to get the Hulk. He's got to, he's got to suit it. You got to get him suited up. And here comes banner, right? Here comes the guy who turns into the Hulk and he's puttering up on his little motorcycle. Burp, burp, burp. And they go, man, you got to get in there. You got to get into the fight. We need the Hulk. Where's the Hulk? You got to suit up. How are you going to, how are you going to turn into the Hulk? You got to get angry. And banner, as he gets off the motorcycle and he looks back at the Avengers, turns right into the camera and he says, well, that's a little secret. I'm always angry. <laughs> oh, nice. And then he turns into the Hulk, you know, and he turns into the Hulk and he comes in there and he starts fighting these, these flying metal caterpillars. I don't know what they, what they are. They look like caterpillars to me. Yeah, but he, yeah. he goes in there and of course starts just, you know, uh, kicking butt all over the place. So the point of the story is this, just like David Banner is always angry. I mean, you're always going to be insecure, nervous, confident, joyful, sad, depressed. I mean, because we're human, we got all, we got all those emotions and all that thinking available for us, it's at our disposal anytime we choose to look at it. But that also means that we don't necessarily have to look at it. And we can look in the direction of action. We can look at the wave that is right in front of us rather than getting lost in thoughts and, and branding and labels that don't, doesn't serve us. And in spite of David Banner's anger, he's able to keep it together. <laughs> and when he looks at his as anger, he turns into the Hulk. And that's true for me too. And uh, maybe it's true for the, the folks listening to this call. So again, the, the key takeaway is just because a train of thought shows up doesn't mean you have to ride that train. And we are great at two things. As human beings, we're great at two things. One is making up a bunch of crap to think about. And the second thing is letting go of our thinking and solving real problems. And which category do you want to be in? Nice, man. I think that's a beautiful way to end it. I really do. So, Chris, if people want to find out more about you, your work, your keynotes, your books, where can they find you? Sure. I've got a couple of websites that I that I want to share with you. The first one is westfallonline.com. And my last name, it's like the direction and the season. Of course, we don't say autumn here in the United States. We say fall. westfallonline.com. And that will tell you more about my speaking, coaching, and consulting. And then for some of the latest programs that I'm offering, uh, including online group coaching programs, that's Chris Westfall. Dot net, and you can find out about the latest programs that are available there. Of course, you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, all of those places, Westfall Online. That's my handle, and you can find me there. Oh, and I also want to mention this, Aiden. Uh, if you're interested to see some of the videos that I've created, I've created a, a library of resources on effective leadership communication skills, and that's my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Westfall Online author of Leadership Language Using Authentic Communication to Drive Results, Chris Westfall. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.